So I've been recording these audios uh, when I was driving on the way to work, talking about futurism and different stuff, and I just want to talk about a few different things, a couple different verses, and I was looking at a recent video that Robert Breaker uploaded called Questions and Answers Part 12, and I haven't watched the whole thing, but just at the beginning of it, he starts talking about the Millennial Kingdom, and he uses a verse that I see that people can get mixed up on, too, and that is... Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. I'll look at that. Well, before I say that, I guess that I want to say that uh, the brother who's commented on the channel recently talking about preterism and which preterism believes, you know, a lot of these prophecies uh, were fulfilled in the past and stuff. And I'm saying that, that you know, in Jan Daniel chapter 9, the prophets were already fulfilled with, you know, the coming of Christ and his ministry. And uh, so I guess in that sense, I could be considered a preterist. And I forgot about the All of It discourse and the stuff that's said there. You know, I'm going to have to relook at all that again, too. But as far as the book of Revelation, you know, I, I think I'm more of an idealist. I see Revelation as an allegory, the whole vision. It's like a visual uh, parable, you know, that John wrote down. And we're all to uh, examine that and, and uh, interpret it and then get, you know, what ideas you know Jesus wanted us to get from that and but for some reason in the past there's some things that I've read about preterism I'm not sure there's like a variance of views and that stuff but I mean I guess the basics that they believe that some of these prophecies were fulfilled but and that in some senses they still believe in like a seven-year tribulation or an antichrist and stuff and they believe they just believe that it happened in the past and uh, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that but, and, you know, they view, like, uh, the second coming of Christ as, like, the destruction of the temple or something like that, or the day of the Lord was the destruction of the temple, where I would believe Christ is when we die and we meet the Lord. And, you know, and that's the same thing that, uh, you know, the passage in First Thessalonians 4, where people attribute that to the rapture. It's just talking about the resurrection, where we meet the Lord. Just like when Stephen died and, you know, was stoned to death who did he see he saw jesus and just like you know when paul said that you know uh he was prepared to die to meet the lord and so jesus said you know he he's making he made a place for the disciples or for all of us and that uh he will return to receive us you know it's where he is and that's when we die so that's how i see all of that is all together um but uh, so there could be those variances in preterism, maybe, you know, a long time ago, I, there's a website that I've went to f and found a lot of good information, and it's a preterist w website, so uh, I don't usually, or whatever, but maybe I am, and maybe that's something that I need to consider more. But as far as Revelation goes, I'm an idealist, and I'm going to try more and more to kind of explain, you know, how I... Uh, how I think of, I view Revelation so people can understand that and try to grasp that. But it's basically like, you know, like a, a big parable, an allegory. Um, a vision that Jesus showed John, he said, write down everything that you see. It's like a movie, he's playing in front of him, basically, and, and uh, everything, you know, that he writes down is, uh, you know, it's all symbolic and it's all apocalyptic writing and we're supposed to um, you know, decode it in a sense and get the, the ideas that are presented there, um, the list and so Revelation 5.10, I saw Robert Breaker mention this when he's talking about the Millennial Kingdom and Revelation 5.10, let's look at that. Revelation 5.10 says, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And so automatically, people see the literal thousand-year reign on the earth uh, being spoken of here. We shall reign on the earth. And so they try to take that as, as literal, uh, you know, reigning on the earth literally, like as a authoritative figure, like a literal king or priest. And 
also adding into the interpretation for the thousand years because it doesn't mention a thousand years here just like in Revelation 20 when it mentions a thousand years and reigning for a thousand years it doesn't mention on the earth uh, but people could say well here it does mention on the earth but here it doesn't mention a thousand years so um, people try to string all these passages together this is how you know you come up with systematic doctrines and uh, you know there's a lot of false systematic doctrines where people are stringing things together coming up with stuff that the Bible totally doesn't teach and uh, I think it's just because you know at first glance these things seem to be true and they're just told over and over again an overwhelming you know amount of people believe this but I want to look into it more and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth well, who's saying this what is the whole context of this you know we have to go back some verses and look at what's going on here um, so this section in Revelation 5 uh, the E sword here calls the scroll of the lamb uh, so John is seeing you know happening in heaven is the idea and I beheld, and lo, verse 6, in the midst of the throne of the, and of the face of the elders stood a lamb as, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And here we see Jesus depicted as a lamb, a literal lamb, with seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent to go forth into all the earth. And, um... You know, you don't see too many people trying to take that literally. We understand that that's all symbolic. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And so I'm guessing that the four and twenty elders are the ones who say this in verse 10, and we'll continue. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And, um, so... And then it says, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And so there's this idea that, you know, these people are in heaven. And so the idea that saying that they shall reign on the earth is, you know, they're not reigning on the earth there because they're in heaven. So it has to be like a future time. So, you know, it's later on when Christ implements this literal physical thousand year reign. Uh, but, you know, that's not the case. Okay. First of all, like I said, we have to look at Revelation as an allegory. This whole thing is an allegory, uh, completely symbolic, and and so it's the four and twenty elders that, that are saying this. And basically, what I would think, you know, they probably just they represent the church. You know, they represent Christ, every believer, basically, and um, the fact that. That says that, that we shall reign on the earth is that even presently you know we reign on the earth uh, the kingdom of God uh, in certain ways you know in spiritual figurative sense and we are already made kings and priests okay because of our uh, union with Christ and and so you know we already um, have this and, and the, the, the fact that it says that we shall reign on the earth doesn't mean that it's only like your tense, okay? It's also present. It's presently and forevermore. And just like if I look up shall reign. Uh, I'm just going to do a search for that. And I'm sorry if this is not really coming through clearly to you. These are just some ideas. I just I mean I just looked at this video the other night and just studied some of these commentaries the other night. I'm gonna go over some commentaries. But this the 
Revelation 5.10 and how Robert Breaker and all the futurists would interpret it and you think, you know, what is of this, you know. Um, oops, didn't spell it right. <laughs> Shall reign. Okay. So just like this first one, Exodus 15, 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now, does that mean that the Lord isn't currently reigning and that he only will be reigning in the future? No, it doesn't. It means that he reigns now and he's going to reign forevermore. Just like the body of Christ, we reign now on the earth. Okay, in spiritual senses, we reign over, uh, you know, we reign over sin and death and even more so when we are completely freed of, you know, this life and we are completely glorified with Christ in heaven, you know, then we will completely, you know, have the fulfillment of completely reigning. Uh, but we do reign now and forevermore. Okay. And so we reign now on the earth. So that being said, let's look at some commentaries of this. And, you know, I was just looking just now at this Kaufman's, and I might skip around through some different ones, because I don't really remember which ones I was looking at last night. There's obviously, there's a lot of futurist interpretations. You know, we can look at Albert Barnes first, actually. He's a futurist, and he even says, uh, he talks about the, the thousand-year uh, reign, because he believes that, but let's see here. Basically, I'm just looking for a part. That's not Albert Barnes, is it? We shall reign on the earth. Let me see. Really agree what with what Albert Barnes says either, but uh, he says though that it is not said that this will be a reign under the Savior and a literal kingdom on the earth, nor is it said that the saints will descend from heaven and occupy thrones of power under Christ as a visible king. Okay. And then he goes on to say, basically, that he thinks that, you know, Christianity will uh, have, you know, the majority of the majority of people on earth will be Christians, and you know, the the kingdom of God will will reign the earth uh, by having the majority or so or whatever. But you know, I don't really believe that necessarily. But but this is what he says right here, Albert Barnes. He says it is not said that this will be a reign under the Savior in a literal kingdom on the earth. It doesn't say that. Nor is it said that the saints will descend from heaven and occupy thrones of power under Christ as a visible king. It doesn't say that. That has to be added into the text. Okay, you're, you're being told that it says that, you're reading it, and you're thinking that it says that, but you really need to read it for what it says and try to understand it. <clears throat> but... That's not exactly what I was looking for, Albert Barnes, but Kaufman's interesting here, too. Uh, some of these people mentioned there's some discrepancies with, uh, you know, the King James Bible and stuff, but let's see what he says. This is a disputed text, uh, there being even some question of the translation, uh, the meaning comes with absolute clarity. Uh, okay, the saints of Jesus Christ, the Christians of all tribes and nations, are now reigning upon the earth with Jesus Christ. And some people do not wish to believe this, but the dogmatic power of this verse refutes the unbelievers. And so, if even believers don't want to believe it. I'm sure there are people that are probably listening to this saying, we don't reign right now. Well, yeah, we do. Okay. So... The Christians in this current dispensation reign with Christ. Their reign is exactly in the same sense as that of the apostles, reigning with Christ. Matthew 19.28. Ooh, let's look at that. Matthew 19.28. Matthew 19.28. 
Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on in the throne of his glory, yet ye shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay. Well, basically saying that we would have like the same authority with, with Christ, that we have the same position, uh, you know, we will be glorified together with Christ. Anyway, uh, a reign which she affirmed would occur during the times of this regeneration, that is, the, new, the times of the new birth. Oh, that's an interesting one. Meaning of the current gospel age. Hmm. But he does say here, the saints of Jesus Christ, the Christians of all tribes and nations, are now reigning upon the earth with Jesus Christ. Actually, he's up, it looks like Kaufman's upholding the KJV. So he said that the us here means Christians of this present time is obvious. And since that is the true meaning of the passage, no matter how it is translated, the KJV should be retained. We do not suppose that modern scholarship is any better qualified to solve this than the KJV translators. Furthermore, their translation of 1611 is further corroborated and confirmed by the Sinaiticus manuscript discovered in 1859. Bruce and Sace both confirmed this, and Cease, or whatever, elaborated this upon this. I mean, they think that some of them, I think that some of them translate, um, it says, and we shall reign upon the earth, and and some of the other translations say they, that they shall reign upon the earth. But I want this section that's coming up where it says the earthly kingdom virus, and this is still from Kaufman's commentary. Let's look at this. The earthly kingdom virus. Oops, I probably just scrolled past all that. Okay. The first and greatest mistake ancient Israel ever made was rejecting the theocratic government of God and demanding a king like the nations around them in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this mistake was likewise their last, for it blinded them against the coming of their hoped-for Messiah. At the time of the first advent, the Jewish nation, especially its leaders, wanted nothing either in heaven or upon earth as ardently as they wanted the restoration of their earthly monarchy. Obviously ignorant of the fact that a secular kingdom was contrary to God's will the first time, by the time of Jesus, their hopes of a Messiah had denigrated into a carnal, malignant patriotism. And when they knew that Christ had no intention of organizing an army and chasing the Romans, they crucified him. People of our own times who long for some earthly, secular appearance of Christ to establish some kind of a literal kingdom on this earth are guilty of the same mistake as that of ancient Israel. Christ's kingdom is not of this world, said so himself. It is a reign over the passions and appetites of the body, a reign over the lusts and vanities of the flesh, a spiritual reign of a people who, in a sense, are called out of the world with its secular value judgments. The very church means called out. Every line of the New Testament denies that Christ ever intended or that he ever plans to rule in any temporal sense on this earth. Amen. The church age is not to be followed by any so-called kingdom age. The church is the kingdom. And the thousand-year reign refers to the whole time between the first advent and the second advent. I don't know about that one, but it's, he's denying a literal physical thousand-year reign. I agree with that. Okay, uh, How we interpret Revelation could be different. Uh, but many people are not satisfied by the type of kingdom established by Christ, resulting in the projection of all kinds of bizarre and unscriptural notions regarding some future kingdom. If people can bear to hear it, the kingdom has already been in existence since the first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ, the saints of the New Testament were baptized into that kingdom, and there is none other. Hmm. 
Revelation 5.10, where Robert Breaker and others like him would say that it clearly, clearly teaches a thousand-year reign on earth. Uh, and here's John Gill. He's a futurist. He says, not merely in a spiritual sense, though grace reigning over sin and sin through Satan being bruised under their feet, through the victory they have in Christ over the world. So he's saying, he's admitting that there is a spiritual sense. All these futurists will admit that we reign in a spiritual sense. We do reign currently, but then they add on the fact that, oh, we're going to reign, you know, physically, literally, carnally. You think that when it means that Christ has made us kings and priests, that we're going to be literal, physical kings and priests? That's missing the whole point of it, okay? Um, I think that, you know, I need to look into it more, what it means that we're kings and priests. But basically, I mean, we're kings in the, in the fact that, you know, we have authority, uh, you know, with Christ. We can, you know, make the judgments. And the priests, you know, they offered sacrifices for people. And, you know, we go about professing the, the gospel and, you know, that's what offers forgiveness and salvation for people when they believe the gospel. And so in some of those senses it are how we're made kings and priests. And that's the truth of it. And, you know, reigning with Christ is eternal reign, you know, in heaven. And this is all spiritual stuff. And the spiritual far surpasses the physical, you know, in, in every way. So it's, it's carnally minded just to think that why would Jesus come back on this earth for a thousand years, this is a, a weird number of why. I mean, whatever. Uh, it's obviously a symbolic number, but, and then for us to physically, literally be kings and priests, uh, no. Uh, we're already kings and priests, and it's spiritually. So even futurists will admit that we already reign spiritually. They just add on. So even when it says that we shall reign on the earth, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to mean that we don't reign now and we will in the future. No, it means that we do now and we will forever, okay? Uh, we, the kingdom, you know, will forever reign on the earth while believers are on the earth, and we forever reign with Christ in general. And I might have to move off of this because I'm already at like 20 minutes, and I would like to look at some of these other commentaries, but... I remember a really particular one that I was going to look at. Uh, let's see. Here it says, John Trapp, reign over our lusts, reign with and in Christ over all our enemies by his scepter, by his spiritual, not secular scepter. And the last judge of the world. I think, I mean, the way that I look at it is when he says not secular, he means, you know, not, uh, you know, not of this earth, not a, you know, a carnal, not a carnal scepter, but a spiritual, not a physical, literal scepter. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other good commentaries in here. Matthew Poole. There's a lot of these that are futurists. There's a lot of these that are Calvinists. I don't agree with a lot of these, the stuff that's being said on these, but, you know, and I use these commentaries too, though, to show that some people, you know, people have other beliefs that I believe, and, you know, because people will say, oh, you know, you just made this up or whatever. Nobody else believes this, and I'm showing, you know, that some prominent people who have made Bible commentaries these changes are important showing that the kingdom and the reign of the saints on earth are truly now already begun and existing waiting future enlargements and if there are any future enlargements it's when we die and we go to be with Christ for eternity and, and then all, all of our you know, all the promises are fully realized.
kings. This, re this refers to the reign of Christ and the kingdom now present and existing. Made us. It was past performance and establishment. Not a future kingdom, but present. The church is the priesthood now. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. An analogy based on Exodus 19.6. This is Foy E. Wallace's commentary. I don't know who this guy the commentary on Revelation. The church sustains a kingly relation to Christ and of the members reign with Christ. Here, hence, they are kings in royalty with him. And I'm reading this because he's explaining in what sense were we made kings and what sense were we made priests. That's what I was just talking about. Romans 8, 17, and I'm sure, you know, you could go into really deep studies and, and what does it mean that we were made kings and priests. This is a little concise uh, bit here. It is a reference to the state of the church and the gospel under the spiritual government of Christ, 1 Timothy 6, 15. The term king signified a sovereign prince or ruler over a kingdom. Proverbs 8, 15. It is applied to God, the supreme ruler of the universe, Psalms 44, verse 4, and to Jesus Christ, the king and head of the church, Psalm 2, 6, Psalm 45, 1, Ephesians 4, 5, and to all true Christians who, who as heirs reign with him in life. Romans 8, 17, Romans 5, 17, and 2 Timothy 2, 12. Those would be good ones to look at. Priests. The church sustains a priestly relation to Christ, and its members participate in the offering of spiritual sacrifices, Hebrews 13, 15. The word priest is contracted from elder or presbyter, and was a general name of ministers for God's service, Hebrews 10, 11, and all scriptures that denotes one who offers sacrifice. Is it, applied, it is applied to Jesus Christ in the highest offer, office who offered himself for the sins of all men, Hebrews 4, 14, Hebrews 7, 17, Hebrews 8, 14, Hebrews 9, 11, 12. It applies to every true believer, Christian, who himself offers spiritual sacrifices, Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 2, 5, Revelation 1, 6. Under the law, the priest was a person consecrated and ordained to teach the people, pray for them, and offer sacrifices, Leviticus 4, 5, and 6. Christians perform all these services and functions now in the new priesthood, the church. Okay. Reign, the word is variously used literally and figuratively. Commonly, the word reign means to rule or to govern as a sovereign prince. God reigns as absolute monarchy governs and disposes of all things in heaven and earth. Christ reigns in the dispensation of his kingdom and church. All who receive grace and gift of righteousness, forgiveness in Christ, and partake of the spiritual life whereby sin is conquered, Reign with apostles and conforming to their teaching and example, and reign with Christ as in sufferings with him in the, in the death to sin and partaking of his suffering. And then it shall reign, literally rendered the passage reads, are reigning, referring to the Revelation context of their continuing conquests and the trials that were now present. Okay. What the four creatures and 24 elders were chanting in unison as a complete representative company was the prospect of a glorious triumph over their oppressors. It symbolized a reign of victory, a symbol that the oppress, oppress, oppressions to be revealed seals could not consume them, the wrath of the monarchs could not destroy them, nor the power of kings and emperors defeat them. They would survive, they would live, they would reign on the earth, not in future glory, but reign there, and then, as conquerors and overcomers, and an undefeated triumphant cause, the church was symbolized as being complete and imperishable in conflict with their heathen oppressors. We're going on 30 minutes now. What I was going to look at also is Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, which talks about basically, you know, if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. And this is another one where they try to attribute that to the thousand year reign on, on earth. They just don't get that, you know, reigning with Christ doesn't mean this, you know, physical, literal 
being a literal king on the earth for a thousand years or whatever. Um, this, this should be a pretty simple concept. Let's just look at uh, John Gill. Uh, where basically he is a futurist, and we reign with him now in the kingdom of grace. Grace reigns in our hearts where Christ, the king of glory, has, has entered and set up his throne. And, you know, basically then he says we'll, we'll reign a thousand years, and then he says we'll reign for all eternity. So the futurists even believe that we're reigning now, and that we will reign in eternity, being in heaven with Christ, at a thousand years on the earth. We're here in our physical bodies, and we die, and we go to be with the Lord. And that's where we forever will be, it's with the Lord in heaven. Maybe on this one. I actually need to get another drink, and this is like a 30 minute video, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But, anyways, hope you find some of that stuff interesting. So, uh, God bless. <laughs>